SpongeBob Quest Pants was a series of overhead adventure games developed by Fish in a Bottle for Nickelodeon's website. There were only four installments, but it really left an impression on those that used to play it. Fish in a Bottle is a UK-based company with numerous contributions to different cartoons and British television channels. Many might recognize them for Phineas and Ferb, Towerinator, or Peppa Pig Basketball, or Battle of Britain 303 Squadron. Yeah, that's just a little different from the other ones. But with how respected they are in the Flash game scene, we can expect this series to be pretty good. So let's start with the first one, Legend of Deadeye Gulch. Obviously, this is inspired by the episode Pest of the West. This was a massive Spongebob special back in 2008, which was so heavily marketed you could hardly walk two steps without seeing Spongebob in a cowboy hat. Most of the surviving Spongebob toys I still have were from their collab with Burger King. But anyway, this first installment has a few elements from the episode. This was a very difficult game for me to record because it bugged out on almost every site I played it on. It can be painful when it happens late in the game and forces you to start all over again. A classic case of me being attacked by my only bigger nemesis than the Anti-Lucy Club. Modern Advancing Technology. Be wary of this if you try to play it today. So at the start, we hear the same music that we'll continue to hear throughout the series. Now that's foreboding. When you see that we have three save slots, you can expect this to be a somewhat involved adventure. We start in the Krusty Krab where a trillion empty boxes are lying around. We see images of Spongebob and Mr. Krabs that reflect what their text boxes are saying. Very flattering icon of Spongebob down there. According to Mr. Krabs, Pearl spent all of his gold on a million pairs of shoes. Yeah, a million, his own words. I know a few people who would still say that isn't enough. Just as Mr. Krabs says he might need to sell the Krusty Krab, his grandfather appears. He mentions the treasure of Deadeye Gulch, which once belonged to William Krabs, owner of the Krusty Cantina. Deadeye Gulch used to be Bikini Bottom's name. So now it falls on you to find this lost treasure. You do this by using William Krabs' journal, which has some missing pages. Meanwhile, this is all going according to plan for Plankton. He tricked Pearl into buying a million shoes so Mr. Krabs would have to sell the Krusty Krab, so his grandfather would come in and tell him to find the treasure of Deadeye Gulch instead. Quite the convoluted plan, if you ask me. Surprised it went off without a hitch. So when the game begins, we see just how much effort went into it. It's very similar to SpongeBob's Big Adventure, which is another great Flash game. You control SpongeBob with the arrow keys and use the spacebar to interact with stuff. You also have a few icons that can be useful to utilize. You have Clamu's Shop, where you can buy upgrades for different items, as well as accessories for your outfit. If you click on your brain, where this veiny Gary is milling around, you can check your quests, see your items, read descriptions on all the characters you meet, and even collect bonus items. Guess what the bonus items are called in this? Someone grabbed my booty! Not just booty, but bikini booty. You also have a map to keep track of where you are. You can access these in all four of the games. You gotta appreciate the noticeable level of detail before we even get to the gameplay itself. Fish in a Bottle takes their work very seriously. So once you head outside, you can explore Bikini Bottom and talk to the residents. This is where you get all your side quests. You can open clams to find items such as pearls, which act as currency for Clamu's shop. <laughs> That's clever. Of course a clam would accept pearls as currency, but really you're just stealing them from other clams. You reach your first conflict when you need Squidward's reef blower, but he doesn't want to hand it over. You need to get Patrick to take a nap so you can swipe his magazine. They also refer to his rock as a stone. I mean, it is, but I never realized how rarely they actually call it a stone instead of a rock until now. You give Squidward the magazine so he's distracted, and this allows you to take the reef blower. With it, you can clear piles of sand or knock back enemies, but I don't entirely recommend using it against them. It doesn't always work out for me. Instead, you have a spatula you can attack with, but you can replace it with a more efficient karate glove very quickly if you just go inside your house. You can then explore Bikini Bottom and see just how big of a map this is and how many characters there are to talk to. There's also this big hole for some reason. Don't be like me and curiously jump into it. I'm like James from Silent Hill 2 when it comes to big dark holes. But you only start with three lives and get sent back to the start of a map if you lose them. 
Soon, you'll come across a cave and work your way through a dungeon filled with enemies, mostly jellyfish. They aren't too hard if you mash the attack button in front of them, but if you want to keep a distance, your mop acts as a boomerang. You can hit them once when you throw it and kill them when it comes back to you. You can also find switches that open gates throughout the cave, allowing you to travel more. You better be keeping track of where you've been. Soon, you also meet these cave dwellers from the Chum Caverns episode. You then find a page from William Krabs' journal. You read it out loud and find out the treasure is accessible through a cave at Goo Lagoon. Plankton overhears this, so now you have to find the treasure before he can. Through a series of fetch quests for different residents, you can get Larry to move the rock blocking an entrance to the cave. It seems to be a common theme in Spongebob games where you have to get Larry to do something by swaying him with food. Grandma's Pie and Employee of the Month, Jellyfish Jelly and Revenge of the Flying Dutchman, now Lemonade? How good is he at dieting anyway? Now in this cave, you fight Plankton's robots that shoot at you. They're harder than the jellyfish, but not too bad. Unfortunately though, this is where I encountered a bug that froze the game and prevented me from continuing. No matter how much I reloaded my save, the bug just wouldn't go away. I had to find another site and start all over again. Careful if you play this on New Mookie. But once you get through it, you need to head to Jellyfish Fields, which has a bunch of warning signs telling you to turn back. Wow, Jellyfish Fields has never been this dangerous before. I guess it makes sense when there are stinging creatures all over the place. You bribe a cop with a donut to get in the mine. I really like how the items you need for each quest make sense, but the game doesn't outright tell you what to do with them either. You have to use your noggin, but they're never too difficult to figure out. They succeeded in finding the perfect balance. Anyway, you use a slingshot to hit switches from afar and fight your way through the mine. Eventually you find... oh... rip. I know it's just an empty shell, but even Spongebob insinuates that William died in this cave. That's a dark fate for a character in a kid's game. Especially since he canonically had a son he left behind. So then you get to fight Plankton in a giant robot. You don't actually fight him, you just ignore his attacks and flip switches until the robot explodes. I thought this was a boss fight and the switches just made him vulnerable, so you can see me trying to attack him here. Then you find the treasure and Spongebob says, Barnacles. Isn't that supposed to be a bad thing in Spongebob lingo? Then the ghost of Spongebob's ancestor, Spongebuck, appears to him. He tells you to defeat Plankton by cleaning the poop-covered statue in town, just like in the episode. It has the same twist where it turns out to be a statue of Spongebuck, but it also contains the treasure. This concludes the game, but Plankton pulls a Daughtry and tells us it's not over. This was really good, and it's easy to get into. There might be some instances where you wander for a bit, but you're never too lost to the point of frustration. This game is very good about balancing the difficulty. It's just as hard as it needs to be, and really rewarding to complete. But this is only the beginning. We still have three more to go. Let's move on to Mission Through Time, based on the episode Back to the Past, one of my favorites from Season 7. This game also has a lot to it, so get ready. SpongeBob and Patrick are delivering Krabby Patties to the elderly at Shady Shoal's rest home. Nearby, Plankton is teamed up with Man Ray and is planning to steal the Krabby Patty formula. Inside, we find out it's Age Awareness Day. Oh please no, I don't need a whole day to remind me of how old I am. Then Man Ray and Plankton show up to steal the patties. Oh wait, Man Ray just claims he's visiting Gran Ray. <laughs> That's a silly pun. The dialogue is really funny in this game, almost like an actual episode of the show. But he soon goes back on his Gran Ray plans and steals the patties. Thankfully, Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy are here. Unfortunately, they're old. Thankfully, they have a time machine, so you can go back in time and ask their younger selves for help. As you walk around the rest home, it's important to note that Patrick has a sudden interest in crocheting. Also, this old guy asks you to dance. Life lesson, if some old guy comes up to you and asks to dance, it's probably best to run away as quickly as possible. But once you head to the Mermalair and find the time machine, no one really knows how to use it. So you stumble your way to the future where Man Ray has taken over. I really like this location and the ability to travel through an apocalyptic Bikini Bottom. It's like a Spongebob version of Half-Life 2. Welcome to Bikini 17. You also get to see desecrated versions of your favorite locations. The images of the Krusty Krab and Spongebob's house being destroyed are surprisingly powerful. Squidward's house is also... Ugh. And Patrick's is just gone. Just a hole now. There's also Perch Perkins, who's been beaten up pretty badly. 
Looks like Man Ray wasn't happy with the press he was getting. You also meet these Man Ray Stingrays that shoot at you. They're kinda tough, but easily avoidable. You find a cave and travel through it, avoiding these playful urchins. Soon, you find Plankton's hideout and learn that Man Ray betrayed him. He gives you a Freeze Ray and a book on time travel to help you. However, I soon learn that the Freeze Ray is a little too powerful. This is because it has a habit of freezing the whole game when I use it. Again, it's probably just the result of age. See, this is why we need Age Awareness Day. Thankfully, I was able to reload my saves every time. I just tried to use it as little as possible. Now here's where I got completely lost. I saw the south part of the map was blocked by a laser gate that hurts you when you touch it. Because of this, I was wandering around for a bit, not knowing what to do. Only when I went south at the right moment did I realize that if you wait, the lasers temporarily disappear and allow you to pass through if you're quick about it. You can blame my lack of patience for this. Then we're met with a new mechanic, the pressure pads. You have to lead an enemy over to one, then freeze them to open a gate for a brief time. I'm 50-50 on how I feel about this. On one hand, it's a creative feature that switches up the gameplay, but on the other, it can be a little tedious. Thankfully, this obstacle isn't in that much of the game. So once you travel through this cave on the way to Man Ray's lair, you find a portal back to the present. Ain't that convenient? Just make sure you've done all your exploring before you enter it, because you can't go back for a while. When you hit the machine again, you go to prehistoric times. You don't actually get to spend much time here, but you meet your ancestors and it's nice to have another stage to explore. You also get to see Gary's giant ancestor. That would hurt just a little more than a Great Dane if it playfully jumped on you. Next up, it's off to the 80s. I love this stage because even the background music is trying to sound like the 80s. This is where you can visit Spongebob's childhood home, but for some reason, his parents are still old. Jeez, how old are they exactly? Your dad tells you you look like his brother Sherm, but without a bow tie, which is important to remember. Then you head to your new house to see Spongebob and Patrick as babies. It also turns out that the Squarepants and the Stars are longtime friends, touching how their friendship goes so far back. Now you get an incredibly clever sequence where you give your past self the book on time travel so you become an expert on using the machine in the future. You're then able to travel to the different time periods at will. That is so incredibly clever. I had the biggest smile on my face playing this. But now you can travel to the 50s to meet the younger heroes on a film set. When you tell Merman Man why you've come, he says he's too busy with his TV career to help, but he tells you Man Ray is weak to tartar sauce. He also gives you the Murmurang, which serves the same purpose as the slingshot in the last game. How do you get the tartar sauce, you ask? Well, the stars are having a barbecue in the 80s and they happen to have some. So you get a magazine on crocheting from a lady at Shady Shoals and give it to the baby Patrick. He then has a bow tie in the present, which he gives you and allows you to pass as Uncle Sherm in the past. Recognizing you, the stars let you into their barbecue and you can take the sauce. Again, the writing is so clever in this. It feels so satisfying to figure out this sequence of events. But now here's where it gets confusing. You have to head back to Man Ray's lair in the future to stop him, but wouldn't it make more sense to stop him in the past? It gets a little confusing, and I'm not entirely sure how you go about defeating Man Ray in the past by defeating him in the future. Actually, now that I think about it, this whole game could have been resolved if you just traveled back in time and stopped Plankton from stealing the patties. You learned how to use the time machine after you gave your baby self the book, so what's your excuse? Anyway, you fight through an onslaught of enemies until you reach Man Ray and defeat him by presenting him with the sauce. Just the sight of it is enough to make him give up. He hands over the stolen patties, or singular patty according to the cutscene, and claims he only ever wanted to be loved. So Spongebob makes Man Ray Awareness Day to appease him. So you quite literally made a holiday in honor of a ruthless dictator. Well, at least to stop him from becoming a ruthless dictator, but yeah. Aside from getting extremely confusing at the end, I really like this one. The time machine and the ability to change the present by altering the past make this really amusing, and the puzzle's extra fun to figure out. This might be my favorite of the four, but let's not get ahead of ourselves because there are still two left. The third one is called The Curse of the Flying Dutchman, not to be confused with The Revenge of the Flying Dutchman. This time, the character icons are different and the overall atmosphere feels different too. Spongebob and Patrick are blowing bubbles, even acknowledging the last games by saying no more questing for us, and then the Flying Dutchman appears and we get comical scenes of them screaming. He turns everything green and ghostly, wanting to ghostify all of Bikini Bottom until he finds something he lost. Let me take an absolute random guess and say it's his dining sock. 
Oh, there it is. He said the title. SpongeBob and Patrick decide to go see Sandy because she has an anti-ghost gizmo, which is oddly convenient. Hey, even the game acknowledges how convenient it is. That's what we call a lampshade. But as you explore Bikini Bottom, you might notice that SpongeBob and Squidward's houses are switched. Did the Flying Dutchman do that? It's never really explained. You can talk to some of the Dutchman's ghosts and they tell you not to shine flashlights on them. You can even bring chocolate to Tom, who predictably goes mad over it. But why is he so small? Heh, <laughs> response Silba. Once you go into Sandy's now very creepy tree dome, you find she isn't there. And if you go into this cave, it's too dark to see. But you do find styling wax you can bring to Squilliam in exchange for a candelabra, which you can trade with the girl who forgot to put on sunscreen. She gives you a head torch, and the fact that they call it a torch reminds you that Fish in a Bottle is in fact a British company. But with it, you can see inside the spooky kelp forest. I like this location. It's spookier than what we're used to seeing in the series. There are green jellyfish and evil ghosts flying around, and for now, you can't fight the ghosts. But you can reach a cemetery, which is surprisingly less creepy than the forest. Though there are little ghoulies lying around. And I was right, someone stole the Dutchman's dining sock. He really needs to nail that thing down or something. You also get a flashlight from Al Gristlepuss, which you can use to fight the ghosts. Sort of. It's actually not a great weapon. It doesn't have very good range, and the ghosts will probably hit you before you can reach them with it. It's still just best to avoid them. Not to mention it's a pain having to switch between the karate glove and the flashlight when you're being hit with both jellyfish and ghost enemies. Eventually, you uncover which ghost took the dining sock, then you dig it out and head to find Sandy. This requires going through a different side of the forest. Also, King Neptune's out here for some reason. Just cuz. Then you reach the Dutchman ship and work your way through it until you find Sandy. She gives you the anti-ghost gizmo, and it's a massive pile of garbage. Not only is its range almost just as bad as the flashlights, you need to hit a ghost twice to kill it rather than once. Spend the pearls to upgrade it as soon as you get it. This greatly improves its range and damage capacity. So then you get to fight through a few armies of ghost enemies, then you reach the Flying Dutchman in his quarters. You give him the sock, and he's so distracted by it that he ignores Spongebob's request to turn his home back to normal. This is just a joke, but gonna be honest, they drag it on for way too long. But the Dutchman agrees to turn everything back to normal, and that's the end. Now I'm not involved in the Quest Pants fandom or anything, so I don't know what the popular opinions on these games are, but from my personal experience, I found this to be the weakest of the four. I like the scenario and the atmosphere of it, but it really does feel like you move from point A to point B rather than find more unique ways around. It seems like this one focused more on fighting through onslaughts of enemies and less on figuring out what to do. As a standalone game, it's pretty fun. It's just the fact I would have expected them to try and one-up the time machine mechanic from the last one. Now the final installment is called Sponge Star Patrick Pants. For the first time, we have different menu music. We're at the Bikini Bottom Science Fair and Sandy is showing off an invention. Hey look, see how there are three monkeys here? Remember that for later. Sandy's invention is a teleporter and she plans to use it to make Spongebob and Patrick switch places. It doesn't appear to work, which upsets the crowd, but it actually worked in a completely different way. Spongebob and Patrick have swapped brains. So now you play as Spongebob and Patrick's body and try to find a way to switch back. First of all, I love that they switched things up for the last game to avoid being too repetitive. For now, you can run around the science fair in Bikini Bottom as a whole. If you go to talk to Sandy's bosses from the episode Chimps Ahoy, you'll hear that Lord Reginald got lost on his way over there, even though he was literally in the opening cutscene. Not a big issue, just kind of funny. Also, Squidward has a science project of his own, a simple potato as a power source. Remember that for later. Patrick's body is actually fun to use in this. It doesn't have as many item slots as Spongebob's did in the games before, but it's a welcome change of pace. You also quickly discover the ability to lift rocks with it. I love carrying them as far as I can, but you sadly can't take them with you into new areas. Don't you just hate that? I'm so sorry, regular rock Rick. Look, I'm throwing it at people. This is too much fun. Take that, you loser. My project's better than yours. <laughs> I'm gonna destroy all your hard work. When you complete enough quests to retrieve a shovel, you can dig your way into this cave and throw rocks at enemies, though it's easier to just attack them. This'll eventually lead you into a secret Krusty Krab entrance. 
Plankton's outside and complains that he only found potatoes when he tried to sneak in. I guess he's still shaken from when his family opened a restaurant selling them. I like this area because it's not like anything else we've played through in the games before it. I always appreciate indoor dungeons with fitting design choices. Here, you use the rocks to activate pressure pads. You pull switches, move through rooms, and eventually find potatoes. Remember when Squidward said they work as a power source? Well, Sandy happens to need one. She also needs an antenna, though. Also, look at Patrick. He's slowly eating more and beefing up SpongeBob's body as you progress. To get the antenna, you need to get a comic from some kid. He's hungry, so you have to trade him something for it. So you go get ice cream and bring it to a deep fryer and turn it into fried ice cream. Then you- oh wait, sorry, that's a completely different game. You actually trade him a candy bar. You trade the comic for this dweeb's stupid antenna, then you give it to Sandy, but it just isn't enough. Also, Patrick calls Spongebob out for having slow metabolism. I can't believe Spongebob is literally me. Now you head into Monster Caverns to find a crystal capable of completing Sandy's device. First we had to go to Monster Island, now the Monster Caverns? What's next? Monsters, Inc.? I like the gemstone formations here, and these geysers that shoot lava are a nice new obstacle. This is a really cool envir- Ah. Ah. That is one gory sight. Look, I'm getting demolished because I'm so flabbergasted by it. Even if it's deemed appropriate by cartoon standards, that is very disturbing. So now we reach our final boss, and guess what it is? Yep, that's a sea bunny. I really feel like this is also a Monty Python reference, at least a subtle one. A killer rabbit being the final boss? It's also the only proper boss fight in any of the games. You actually have to tire it out and attack it. The most formidable enemy in the Quest Pants series is a Jaruna Parva, who would have guessed? But once it's defeated, you get this giant crystal and return to find- oh my goodness. Yep, that's still me. So you switch bodies back and Spongebob is angry because his body is ruined. Thankfully, Sandy has another invention called the Treadmillinator. I guess it's the predecessor to the Towerinator. This has been part of the Fish in a Bottle cinematic universe. I like this one, but it did feel shorter than the ones before it. Maybe I just got the hang of it and kinda knew what to do, but still. This one's really cute, and I appreciated the change of pace. I also like the addition of being able to throw rocks around. This was a nice deviation from the regular format. As a whole, I like the entire series, and all of them are worth playing in a row. There's a lot of noticeable effort that went into each of these, and the developers cared about making legitimate games that allowed you to use both your mind and skills to accomplish the goals. It's nice to look back on them, and they're even worth playing today. They wanted to make a good series of Spongebob games, and I'd say they very much succeeded. Thank you for joining me, I will see you in the next memory.